and welcome to TV Africa News and thank you for always joining us. This is Africa Today. My name is Najuma Lima, but first are the headlines. Uganda on high alert as U.S. warns citizens in Kenya of potential terror attack. South Africa man confesses to starting parliament fire but pleads not guilty. In sports, Patrick Cadu returns to KCCAFC. Welcome once again now the news in detail. Ugandan security has said that they are on high alert after a warning by the U.S. Embassy in Kenya of potential terror attacks. The U.S. Embassy in Kenya issued an alert warning of the potential increased crime and acts of violent extremism in Kenya. We have more. The U.S. Embassy warned on Friday and reminded the public of the continued need for sustained vigilance in public locations such as shopping malls, hotels, airports, clubs, restaurants, transportation hubs, schools, places of worship, and other areas frequented by tourists as they are at a higher risk for violence. Addressing journalists on Monday, Police spokesperson Fred Enanga said the terror threat is still around the country following the November 16th train blasts targeting the Central Police Station and Parliamentary Avenue in Kampala. According to the police spokesperson, Wellas Security is on alert following the warning by the U.S. Embassy in Kenya to its citizens. The public must also play their role by being vigilant. The development comes at a time when the UPDF, in a joint operation with the Congolese Army, FADRC, are pursuing allied democratic forces rebels in the thick DRC forests. ADF is accused to have masterminded the train blasts in Kampala last year and by pursuing them inside DRC, Uganda aims at completely wiping out the rebel group which was a few years ago declared a terrorist group by the U.S. Following the attacks on their bases in DRC, many ADF rebels are said to have escaped and are currently on the run. Moving on, opposition Democratic Party has urged the government of Rwanda and Uganda to now focus on resolving their disagreements that led to the closure of Gatuna border three years ago following its reopening on Monday this week. Nalugo reports. While addressing journalists at their party headquarters in Kampala, the party spokesperson, Okolel Opio Lo Amanu, said the closure of Gatuna border made Uganda lose a lot of revenue hence urging the two heads of state to focus on resolving the primary cause of their conflicts. The two heads of state should focus on resolving the primary contradictions that may have caused their conflict, which in our opinion has inferred from the subsisting accusations and co-accusations is distrust. There is a lot of distrust between these two countries. We wish to advise the heads of government in these two countries that the new arrangement should be anchored on trust and goodwill, the absence of which may cause a similar occurrence in the future. Okolel also advised that the new arrangements should be anchored on trust and goodwill, the absence of which, in their opinion, inferred from the subsisting accusations and counter accusations, is district. We have resolved to write the Ministry of Labor addressing our concerns about the torture and the mistreatment of Ugandans that are taken to the United Arab Emirates as the domestic workers. We shall give our recommendations as the Democratic Party to the Minister and thereafter, we shall accord her enough time to see to it that she does implement whatever that uh, we shall have talked about. 
The Rwandan government had shut down the Gatuna border in 2019, citing harassments of its nationals by Ugandan officials. Shigali had also accused the Ugandan government of instigating dissidents within Rwanda and encouraging those allegedly trying to usurp power from President Paul Kagame. DP is also concerned about the continued violation of human rights of domestic workers by their employees in Arab countries, saying as the Democratic Party, they will continue to fight for the rights of citizens. Nalgo Muyingo, Africa Today. As Uganda joins uh, the rest of the world to commemorate the World Wetlands Day on 2nd February 2022, the Wood and Environment Ministry vows to prioritize conservation and define sensitive guidelines on utilizing wetlands across the country. Kachanchu has more. During a press briefing, the Minister of Water and Environment, Honorable Sam Cheptoris, said as the world commemorates the Wetlands Day, Ugandans need to reflect on this year's theme, Wetlands Action for People and Nature, that combines need to integrate both human and nature needs, which are very important aspects. Being derived from the recognition that wetlands offer important services but are facing increasing pressure from people who should protect them, they need more financial, human and political capital investments for their conservation. The theme combines the need to integrate both human and nature needs. And this is quite important. The theme is derived from recognition that wetlands offer important services but are facing increasing pressure from the very people who should protect them. Myself and yourself. We are supposed to protect them. It calls for more financial, human and political capital investment in order to conserve the wetlands we have. It further lays emphasis on the need to promote the sustainable use of wetlands resources so as to meet the socioeconomic needs without compromising other services provided by wetlands for nature preservation. The contributions of Nabijizi wetlands to water supply in Masaka City and also to the provisions of products for the various stakeholders is a great example of the interface between people and nature and the, the honorable minister said that despite the valuable services provided by wetlands they are the most threatened ecosystems globally noting that approximately 35 percent of the world's wetlands were lost between 1970 to 2015 and the rate of loss is accelerating annually since 2000. Uganda has not been an exception, with its wetland cover declining from 15% in 1994 to 13% in 2019, arising from poor resource planning and land use management. Gentlemen, despite the valuable services provided by wetlands, it has been realized that they are the most threatened ecosystems globally. Approximately, 35% of the world wetlands were lost between 1970 to 2015. And the rate of loss is accelerating annually since 2000. Uganda has not been an exception with its wetlands coverage declining from 15.6 in 1994 to 13% in 2009 arising from the poor resource planning and land use management. It is important to note that even the 13% that we have as wetland is not entirely intact. Actually, only 8.9% of Uganda wetland covers is still intact. In order to address the rampant degradation, the minister says it has continued profiling benefits which individuals, communities and the economy derive from the wetlands through the wetland economic valuation studies. Let's take a quick break. We will be right back.
Welcome back. You're still watching TV Africa News, The Right to Know. South African prosecutors revealed on Saturday that the man accused of causing a devastating fire at Parliament in January confessed to starting the fire in an event that shocked the nation in early January. The 49-year-old suspect Zandire Christmas Murphy was arrested on the morning of 2nd January inside the historic building while firefighters were still battling the blaze. The man who is believed to be homeless was taken into custody and appeared in Cape Town on Saturday for a bail application. The hearing was broadcast live on television. In an affidavit read during the hearing, Christmas Murphy say that setting fire to Parliament was the right thing to do because it does not help citizens of South Africa. The suspect also told investigators that he did it to prevent President Cyril Ramaphosa from delivering a speech to the nation scheduled for February and to demand his resignation the release of the murderer of an anti apartheid fighter, $95 in assistance for all South Africans with no income. Firefighters struggled for more than 48 hours to bring the fire under control, which caused no casualties but totally destroyed the National Assembly, which Sue Ramaphosa called the act a futile attempt to threaten democracy. At an earlier hearing, Mpofo said Christmas Murphy had been diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic. But the defense refused a new psychiatric assessment that would exonerate him. The Burkina B. Junta has announced the restoration of constitutional order just one week after a coup ousted elected President Kabore. The 37 article document lifts the suspension of the constitution after its suspension in the aftermath of the January 24th coup. In a statement read on television on Monday, a spokesman of the military notified the population that the junta had approved a fundamental act. According to the statement, it guarantees independence of the judiciary and presumption of innocence as well as basic liberties spelled out in the June 2, 1991 constitution, such as freedom of movement and freedom of speech, as well as securing power in the hands of the military. Military. Under the Fundamental Act, the Junta officially named the Patriotic Movement for Preservation and Restoration ensures the continuity of the state pending the establishment of transitional bodies, a transition that was given no timeline so far. It formally identified coup leader Lieutenant Colonel Paul Henry Sandaugo Damiba as president of the Patriotic Movement for Preservation and Restoration. This role also so encompasses the president of Burkina Faso, head of state and supreme leader of the armed forces as Lieutenant Colonel Cyprian Kabore, spokesperson of the MP. Sara Red. Sam Burkina Bay held the, the leader of the Patriotic Movement for Safeguard and Restoration, Lieutenant Kenal Damiba, after his power grab. However, on the regional scene, ECOWAS sanctioned Burkina Faso by suspending the country from the West African Group. The Economic Community of West African States has sent military chiefs to confer with Damiba on Saturday. On Monday, it is an ECOWAS mission headed by Ghanaian Foreign Minister Shele Ayokol Bochwe that arrived in Ouagadougou and was joined by the UN Special Representative for West Africa and the Sahel, Mohamed Saleh Anadif. President Roach Mark Christian Kabore was overthrown after months of anti-government protests demanding his resignation. Moving on, Angolan President Zhao Rolenko presented key policies he would implement if elected in the August 2022 presidential election. As Rolenko delivered a speech at the launch of the political agenda of his party, MPLA, he cited economic developments accomplished during his tenure. In the diversification of the market economy, continuing the fight against corruption or creating greater supply of public services. In health, we are just some of the many goals President Joao Lorenco has promised to deliver if re-elected. Angola's ruling party confirmed President Lorenco's bid for a second mandate last December. 
the MPLA has led the third biggest oil producer in Africa since independence from colonial power Portugal. Joao Lorenco was first elected in 2017 after serving as defense minister under President Jose Eduardo dos Santos. In his campaign on development and progress, the country's economy has not yet overcome a recession. Angola's oil-driven economy has remained stuck since 2016. Away from that, former South African President Jacob Zuma was back at the Peter Maritzburg court on Monday. The 79-year-old man challenges an October court ruling banning his plea to replace the chief prosecutor in his corruption trial. South Africa's ex-president Jacob Zuma made a surprise court appearance in his latest bid to replace the chief prosecutor in a long-run corruption trial over 1990s arms deal. On Monday, he was back at the Pieter Marisburg. The politician already appeared to court last October. A court ruling then banned his plea to replace the chief prosecutor in his trial. Zuma accused prosecutor Billy Donor of partiality and claims he is guilty of misconduct. So this time, the former president is asking for court to grant him leave to appeal the judgment. Back in 1999, Zuma allegedly took bribes in an arms deal with the French defense giant Thales. Aged 79, Zuma was in September released from prison due to ill health two months into a 15-month jail sentence for refusing to collaborate with a graft probe in his 2009-2018 presidency. The corruption trial is set to start off on April 11th. Let's once again take a quick break. We will be right back. Welcome back. You're still watching TV Africa News, the right to know. In our business news today, the CEO of oil giant Total met with Mozambique's president, Felipe Nyusi, on Monday. His visit aimed at relaunching a gas production project that was suspended last year. We have more. Following a jihadist attack in March 2021, Total halted operations at a site exploring a major gas field in northern Mozambique. Then the energy giant shut its operations and withdrew all staff. The gas project was worth more than 15 billion US dollars, but the gas which Cabo Delgado province had been battered by a jihadist insurgency in 2017. The violence has so far killed at least 2,600 and displaced nearly 700,000 people. Total Energies planned to start the production on site in 2024, but it was postponed until 2026. Patrick Poyan was hopeful for a return of security that would enable farms and residents to head back to the Cabo Delgado province. Last summer, Rwanda and countries part of the South African Development Community sent at least 3,000 soldiers. Mozambique does not produce oil and therefore relies on imports. However, the country is one of the largest holder of gas reserves in Africa. In our health news today, the number of new COVID-19 cases that had started rising towards the end of last year has significantly dropped in the past week with only 79 cases reported on Monday. Results of COVID-19 tests done on January 29, 2022 confirmed 79 new cases. The cumulative confirmed cases are 161,772 results from the Health Ministry show. The number of patients admitted to health facilities with COVID-19 has gone down with 177 cases registered today. 
the cases that started going up in the last week of December 22nd, 2021 rose to as high as 1,936 cases on January 2nd, 2022. But for two weeks now, the new cases have dropped to less than 500. The positivity rate has also dropped from 20% to now 1.7% as of today. However, since January 24th, the number of COVID-19 doses administered has stagnated at 1.2 million. The breakdown of cases per district was Kampala with 43, Wakiso with 13, Moyo with 7, Barara with 3, Hoima with 2, Luero, Ivanda, Mukono, Amur, and Xoro with 1 cases each. Six truck drivers also tested positive. One death was reported today, bringing the total number of persons who have died at 3,528 deaths since the outbreak of the pandemic in March 2020. A total of 99,289 patients have recovered. Unlike the second COVID-19 wave between June and July 2021, where the Delta variant saw many deaths and admissions, scientists have urged that the new Omicron variant is mild in nature. And in sports, a well-known public secretary was confirmed Monday afternoon with KCC AFC announcing that striker Patrick Cadu has completed a return to MTN Omond Stadium on transfer deadline day. Cadu has signed a six-month contract until the end of the 2021-2022 season, after which KCCA has the option of extending his contract for a further two years if he pleases manager Mole Biekwaso. Kachancho reports. The 26-year-old who left the Casasro boys in 2019 on a reported 10,000 US dollar fee for Morocco side Ares Bakena returns on a free transfer after a largely unsuccessful three-year period in the Maghreb region. He spent only five months at Bakena playing only seven games, scoring no goals before he was loaned out to Egyptian side Ismail FC. While Kadu scored on his Ismaili debut, he would play only one more time for them before they decided not to exercise an option to make the move permanent. Bakeni eventually terminated his three-year contract after one year with Kadu joining another Moroccan side, Yusufia Barichid, at the start of the 2020-2021 season. He featured in 15 games in the Botola Pro League, scoring two goals before leaving the club in July 2021. Kadu follows Edrisa Seksambu as the other player Biekwaso has managed to bring back to Lugogo in the current transfer windows. Kampala Capital City Authority fans are excited about the return of striker who spent three years growing from an understudy and developing into a top striker in the league, scoring 14 goals in his final season there. Overall, he scored 32 goals in 64 games, particularly finishing as the top scorer in the 2018 Uganda Cup. Kadu is expected to make his second KCCA debut in Thursday's explosive rescheduled match with Ondo Paraka at the Bombo Barracks grounds in Bombo. That was the news. Thank you for always keeping it TV Africa. Please to stay tuned more programming coming your way.